this novel tells the story of Mrs. Abigail Fisher, who is um, one of the South's most renowned lady of letters, and she is dying. Um, she was a best-selling author for a time, and then her work began to trickle, you know, trickle away as it tends to. Um, she's not the nicest of all possible people. Um, she's estranged from her daughter, and um, this section is from Pistachio, who is uh, her character, uh, who she had cut out of her novel, The Garden of Gethsemane, Georgia. And Pistachio is also very pissed that she was cut out of the book that went on to be the best-selling book of her career. So this section um, involves this whole other world of characters that takes place with every author. So within Mrs. Abigail Fisher's house and home and heart are all of these characters who have been assigned to her. And so they're following her around. They're vying for roles in the right books. They're trying to get everything that they want to be able to get like the starring role. <laughs> so this, this piece is um, Pistachio auditioning for her the role she thinks is going to be the biggest role of her life while Mrs. Abigail Fisher is asleep. You can't talk about this stuff in science. <laughs> Pistachio had been crouched in the corner of the room, batting at cat fur piles in the rising sun. Her turn was coming soon. Abby had finished what the critics were calling her masterpiece with the girl with the red balloon, though sales hadn't matched critical acclaim. Abby wasn't troubled by that yet. She was young, still Abby, not yet Mrs. Abigail Fisher and wicked talented, and she believed then that critics were more important than readers. She believed that if someone said she was good, and Pistachio seemed to recall the review that had sent her soaring, used the word genius in it, then she was good. The rest of the world would take care of itself. Pistachio was in line for the follow-up, the much-anticipated sequel, The Garden of Gethsemane, Georgia. She'd made it through the audition process, which took place at night after Abby had gone to sleep. Somewhere in her dreams, she conducted elaborate screen tests for characters who would win the parts in the next book. She placed them in untenable situations, made them read alliterative iambic pentameter dialogue over and over again, made them twist and twirl and dance. Pistachio had been practicing all these things. She was ready for her lead, and the part, she was sure, the part had been created just for her. Go, dear one, her friends had whispered as she slipped beneath Abby's eyelids on audition night. Show her who you are. Pistachio breathed deep, promised herself she'd remember to speak from her diaphragm as she'd been practicing, and took the dive. There were two other girls waiting in the dark, velveted backstage. One was a redhead who Pistachio instantly dismissed. She knew how much Abby hated redheads. The other, though, had the kind of body that made for compelling book covers, and her hair seemed to have been woven from her, from her scalp into a flowering tapestry of gold. Pistachio's own brown hair was greasy from her nervous sweat. She tried to straighten her spine, stand taller, but the blonde girl was taller without effort, walked on heels made for circuses, and had a mouth that could only utter sweet things. The backstage area smelled of plaster and old paint. The musicians auditioning for the soundtrack were tuning up in the pit. The harpsichord player was off key. The drummer kept trying to dominate the warm-up, and the conductor was on the phone. There was no woodwind section. Did you see the script yet, asked the redhead. Pistachio felt badly that this girl had no chance. <laughs> Y'all are mean, too. <laughs> I didn't think anyone knew the script ahead of time, said Pistachio. She said she did, the redhead pointed at the blonde. Hey, said Pistachio, walking up to the book cover girl. How did you get a hold of the script? The girl looked down a perfect nose as if she'd seen a particularly amusing bug. I asked. She's lying, said Pistachio. You can't ask for it ahead of time. That's just not possible. I mean, if everyone knew what the story was before they got involved with it, how could they be authentic in it? I don't know. The girl extended a pale, veined hand. I'm Lucy, she said. Pistachio felt protective of the frail girl. You know she doesn't like redheads. If Lucy were offended, she didn't show it. My agent said to come anyway. Sometimes the unexpected is the one that fits. Well, I'm Pistachio, and I have been waiting for this role my whole life. Well, how do you know if you haven't seen the script? I dreamed it. Lucy nodded. I did, too. They turned their attention toward the book cover blonde. She can't get it, they both said simultaneously. 
The blonde was uninterested in them. She crossed her legs. The seams of her stockings were perfectly centered along the backs of her thighs. Her circus shoes stayed on her feet, and when she breathed, only her shoulders rose, and even then, just a touch. She can't be breathing from her diaphragm, said Pistachio. <laughs> I don't think she has a diaphragm, said Lucy. <laughs> Next, shouted the woman behind the black curtain. The blonde stood, smoothed her red body sleeve of a dress, cut her eyes at Pistachio and Lucy. Good luck, you two, she said, and disappeared into the next act. Pistachio paced. Lucy sat on a metal folded chair and recited a mantra. Pistachio couldn't hear the words. So many wonderful things can happen if you get chosen for the right role, and the right role actually becomes the right book. Why, there were characters whose names everyone knew. Rumpelstiltskin, Othello, Pinocchio, Anna Karenina, Mr. Darcy, Scarlet, all the little women. These characters grew bigger than their words, bigger than their covers and pub dates, and they touched something previously untouched in people. If a character gets these kinds of roles, they never die. Yes, they become trapped in the role. They're too recognizable as Peter Pan or Daisy to get to breathe in another story, but... Oh, Pistachio wanted to understand what that might feel like, to know that long, long after the creator of the story died, she was one of the creations that lived on. It was unthinkable, and yet it happened over and over again. All the elements had to be in place, and Pistachio was feeling lucky. The blonde returned, head held even higher if that were possible. Pistachio wondered how those heels could support those hips. See you on the shelves, she said leaving a trail of Chanel number no. five in her wake. Lucy continued to mumble her mantra. What are you saying, asked Pistachio. Shouldn't you save your voice? It's nothing, said Lucy, just a prayer. She's too much of a stereotype, said Pistachio. Abby will never pick her. She abhors cliches. Everyone's a cliche, said Lucy. The surprise comes in how we choose to use it. That doesn't make any sense. Next, came the voice from behind the curtain. That's me, said Lucy. Pistachio suddenly hoped Lucy might get the part. Well, not the part, but the supporting role. Good luck, she said. Lucy smiled, her oval face a pale egg. May those born to write, write. May those born to read, read. May we characters always honor both writers and readers and never forget we need both to live. What? That's the prayer, Lucy said. My uncle taught it to me. Who's your uncle? Edwin Drood. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Pistachio couldn't help herself. He was a legend. Who killed him? <laughs> Lucy shook her head. I can't say. Next. I have to go, she said. Remember the prayer. Pistachio was alone in the hall. It was the most horrible of fates to be a starring character like Edwin Drood, only to have your story unfinished because your creator died. What sort of limbo must that be? Other creators try and take your character and make it theirs, but it never works because a character belongs only to one creator. It's just the way things are. There's an allotment of potential characters given to every author. A character can no more jump ship than an author can steal the character of another. Sure, they can try, and they might write interesting things, but they won't have the real characters. They can't. They were never theirs. All of the characters learned this from the very first story they were in. They owed all allegiance to their creator. They were nothing but scraps of senses without her. This was what they had all learned, and this was the way it had always worked. Lucy returned quicker than the blonde. Remember the prayer, she said, but she didn't make eye contact. Next! Wait, said Pistachio, what's she like? You've seen her before, right? In her room? At her desk? Pistachio nodded. She's not like what you saw. And then Lucy was gone. Next! Pistachio inhaled deeply, shrugged her shoulders to pop her spine, and released. Diaphragm, diaphragm, diaphragm. Behind the black curtain was a single wooden chair. A spotlight bathed it in a harsh white circle. The stage floor was scuffed from the heels of hundreds of characters. Pistachio couldn't see into the audience. Sit! She sat in the chair, crossed her legs, thought of the blonde girl with the perfect seams, uncrossed them and tried to just sit taller. Name? Pistachio, she said. Pistachio what? Pistachio Simmons. And what do you do, Pistachio Simmons? I, diaphragm, I tell stories. 
I tell stories, said the voice. I, I meant that I participate in stories. I make stories come alive. I make stories come alive, said the voice. <sighs> what do I do, asked Pistachio. Her shoulders slumped. You do what I write. Are you ready for your own story? Yes. Why? I don't know. Ma'am, whispered Pistachio, I will be in touch. Good day. But you haven't heard me sing, Pistachio thought. You haven't seen me dance or watched me cry. You don't know what I can do. The moment was over, though, her biggest audition yet, and she didn't get to perform her monologue or even give her credentials. Good day, said the voice. But Pistachio sat there. She couldn't convince her body to stand and leave. Is there something else I can help you with? This. Now, this is it. This is all I'm going to get. Yes. Well? The house was pitch dark. Pistachio couldn't even tell where the body attached to the voice was sitting. The spotlight was hot. Sweat dripped down her unseamed legs. You need me, Pistachio said. I beg your pardon. You need me. And why is that? I can see where you're going, said Pistachio. I can take you where you can't see. I'll be in touch. Pistachio stood and left the stage. And when she tumbled back into the darkened bedroom, she was disappointed there was no welcoming party. She'd been imagining too much, already placing herself in the role first of ingenue and later of femme fatale. She saw the yellow dissertations on the complexities of her character already filling the stacks of libraries around the world. It was dangerous for a character to think too far ahead of the story. The character's job was to remain grounded, rooted from one word to the next. The creator's job was the visionary. Pistachio only knew of one character who had wrestled free and managed to live beyond the scope of the author's imagination. No one ever mentioned his full name. He was just the, and the story goes, his creator shot himself in the head. <laughs> that wasn't enough information to narrow it down. Pistachio didn't understand why so many creators killed themselves. There seemed to be, to her mind, no greater thing to be. But perhaps it was difficult having all the characters living in their heads. She'd heard Abby more than once shout to an empty room, shut up, she'd say, after tossing a page into the trash. Or more frequently, what do you want from me? Pistachio could hear all the competing answers to that question, but by the way Abby pressed her index fingers against her temples, Pistachio thought Abby couldn't hear at all. Or maybe she heard too much and couldn't tell which one was more important. Lucy, Pistachio asked the dark, are you here? Nothing, but that was not unexpected. Pistachio decided to strut around the room a little, maybe practice her speeches to classrooms and book groups, maybe even try on Abby's lace-up boots. The shoes were too big for her, too wide, and her flat, narrow feet slipped and slid on the insoles. She tripped on the laces and was headed for a fall right across Abby's stiff, sleeping legs when Harold caught her. What do you think you're doing, he asked, holding her wrist. You want to wake her up? No, I just wanted, you just wanted what? To see what it felt like to play God? We're not made to do that. You know the rules. I know, said Pistachio, her half-written award speech vanishing. It's, it's just that, don't you ever wonder what it would be like? No. She took the boots off, replaced them in their spot in the closet. You're lying, Harold. I don't wonder. She couldn't fathom how he wouldn't have the questions or the curiosity. He was a star already, seven different bestsellers, and Abby hadn't even begun to touch the apex of her career. You're famous, she said. You've been everywhere. I haven't been everywhere, but that doesn't matter. I'm sure I don't wonder because I want to keep being in the stories. I want to keep trying new things and seeing new places. We can't leave the garden, Pistachio. This is where we have been planted. We're lucky. Our creator has talent. We have a chance. Why would you want to destroy it? A character is an open vessel for the creator. We become what she wants us to be. It's always been that way, and the world is full of great literature. This is our job. It's a sacred thing. Pistachio sat on the window seat. Harold was right. She hadn't even been in one story yet, and he'd been all over the world. He'd even kissed an elephant. <laughs> Is that what it takes to be famous, she'd asked. 
Do I have to stop wanting and just pretend? Harold smiled. Right now, 3,218 people are reading about me. 41 people are writing some kind of paper about me. 27 teachers are talking about me. All those versions of me out there. Sometimes I wish I knew who they were. They're you, said Pistachio, aren't they? She'd always thought that she would somehow fracture off into as many selves as she needed to accommodate a wide readership. I'm here, said Harold. The person they're talking about is someone different, and I'm different to each of them. I'm not really sure how that works, but I know that whatever I am underneath all the different names and adventures and lovers comes back here every time to this closet, to you. I find myself wandering the room, wondering what happened to all of us and why I can only see the ones, except you, of course, who were in my most recent story. The heralds who are out there in the bookstores and the classrooms? Tiny piece of me, maybe, but I think those heralds belong mostly to the readers. Pistachio knew from conversations she'd heard in the bedroom that they were not far from the ocean. She'd like to see it sometime. She'd like to hear the waves. She could smell the salt in the air. On nights when the winds shifted west, the sea air made it this far inland. The scent pricked something inside her. She wanted to walk the dunes in moonlight. She wanted to hold a shell to her ear and hear an ocean a continent away. She wanted to see glowfish and sand crabs and maybe even find an unbroken sand dollar. Maybe she'll write me apart by the sea, said Pistachio. You can run the lighthouse, and I can walk along its edges, waiting for my lover to return from his ill-fated voyage. I will walk forever, of course, and you will long for me from the top of the lighthouse. You will contrive ways of speaking to me, even going so far as to invite me in for brown bread and wine, but I will remain unmoved. One morning, you emerge from your house to go into town for food, and you find me half in and half out of the water. The tide is going out, and I am being carried to sea where I will mingle with the bones of my lover. My hair is stringy and wet, my dress is stuck to my legs, and you speak first, my love, my love, and then you howl because it is all you can do because there are no words for what you feel for me, and as you howl, the ocean reaches up its watery arms, and with a big wave, bigger than expected at the waning tide, I am gone, leaving you to walk the perimeter, unable to distinguish the salt from the sea from the salt of your tears. I'd leave the writing to her, said Harold. <laughs> but you do have a flair for the melodrama. It's not melodrama. It's a story. It's not a story, Harold said. It's emotional trickery. But let's not fight. We're here together, maybe just for tonight. What if in the moment she knows she's going to do and you get the call? You can't resist it when it comes. You'll be utterly and completely swept away. Surrender is your only choice. Pistachio knew that wasn't true. She was a good enough performer to pretend that she surrendered, but she would never, not ever, turn over the part of her that wants to walk along the ocean's edge. She would never turn over the part of her that wants more than her creator was capable of imagining. Let's just wait and see if I get the part, she said. It's all just wishing right now. Let's go downstairs, Harold whispered in her ear. We don't want to wake her up. She's deciding right now what she's going to be doing tomorrow. Don't risk changing the outcome. So those are my people <laughs> who live in my closet <laughs> and, and in my head <laughs> and all around. Thank you very much.